Every year, hundreds of people go missing under baffling conditions in the woods of North America. One former police detective named David Politis has investigated thousands of these strange disappearances, and he documents what he finds in his incredible book series called Missing 411. Today, we're going to look at three cases from the Missing 411 that might shed a light on what's behind all these strange disappearances. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please go to the like button's house on a really hot day and ask them to get you a cold drink. While they're away, hide a large raw salmon in their haze. <laughs> While they're away, hide a large raw salmon. I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it coming on. While they're away, hide a large raw salmon in the AC vent. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. West Townshend is a rural area on the east side of Glastonbury Mountain in the American state of Vermont. This is significant because that places West Townshend in the so-called Bennington Triangle, which is apparently one of the most haunted places in America. The Triangle is a loosely defined area that encompasses the ghost town Glastonbury, which used to be a small logging community centered on the eponymous mountain in southwestern Vermont. The town was abandoned at the end of the 19th century after the logging boom died down, so as a result, the greater Glastonbury area that West Townshend is certainly a part of is now untouched pristine wilderness that even by Vermont standards is incredibly rugged and remote. The triangle has earned its spooky reputation due in large part to the alarming number of unexplained disappearances that have occurred there over the last 100 years. Furthermore, over those 100 years, there have been dozens of sightings of the so-called Bennington Monster, which is apparently this eight foot tall creature that roams the mountains of Glastonbury and some people people think that creature is behind many, if not all, of these strange disappearances. On November 23, 1943, 37-year-old Carl Herrick and his cousin Henry decided to go to West Townshend to do some deer hunting. At some point during their hunt, the pair got separated, and Henry spent some time yelling for Carl and looking around for him, but he couldn't find him, and so he assumed he must have gone back to their camp. But when Henry got back to camp, it was empty, and Henry waited around for a little while for Carl, but he had this sinking feeling that something was wrong, and so relatively quickly, he left to get police. Police show up, they launch the search. For three days, they combed the entire area, and there was just not a sign of Carl anywhere. On the third day, Henry discovered Carl's body. He was lying motionless, face down, in a clearing in the woods. Initially, Henry thought maybe he was still alive, so he ran over to him and rolled him over, and very quickly realized that no, Carl was deceased. However, there weren't any obvious injuries to Carl's body. He had some minor scratching on his arms and on his hands, but that was about it. Henry looked around the area and he found Carl's rifle that was loaded leaning up against a tree 70 feet away from where Carl was. Next to his rifle on the ground was an expended shell casing. Also, around Carl's body were apparently huge bear tracks. The official cause of death was baffling. Carl, apparently, was squeezed to death to the point where his rib broke and punctured his lung. So the theory became, Carl must have been out here by himself, he encountered a black bear, he fired one shot at the black bear, thinking it was down, he walked over to check, and the bear attacked him and squeezed him and killed him, the end. But not so fast. If Carl encountered a black bear and fired one shot into the animal based on the one found shell casing, that one shot is not going to be enough to put that animal down, or very rarely is one shot going to be enough to put down a black bear. And Carl, being a hunter, he would know that, and he would want to keep some distance with his weapon up aimed at the animal in case he needed to fire again. But even if Carl was really confident that one shot had taken the bear down, well, why would he risk his life by checking on the animal to make sure it's down without his gun? Why did he place it against a tree and then walk 70 feet over to this animal that if it's not dead, it poses an enormous threat to you? You're all alone and unarmed with a huge bear that you've shot? No one's going to do that. You're going to carry your gun. But even if all of that happened, that Carl unarmed approached this bear thinking it was dead, but the bear's not dead. He's lying in wait and he leaps up and attacks Carl. Even if that happened, black bears don't squeeze people to death. They might scratch you and bite you and rip you to pieces, but they don't squeeze you to death. And Carl only had light scratching on his wrists and on his hands. He did not have any signs of a traditional bear attack. 
So either this is the first time in the history of black bears that a black bear squeezed a person to death or something else squeezed Carl. But what kind of an animal is one so strong it can squeeze a man's chest to the point where it breaks his ribs and two happens to be roaming around the Bennington Triangle? Makes you wonder. Ape Canyon is a gorge on the southeast portion of Mount St. Helens in the American state of Washington. The canyon is so named after a group of miners alleged that ape men, aka Bigfoot, attacked their cabin there in 1924. And if you want to learn more about that specific event, I covered it on my YouTube channel in an earlier video. It's right here. It's called Scariest Bigfoot Attacks, and I'll also include a link in the description. And while some people believe there are literally ape men running around this gorge on Mount St. Helens, there's never been a confirmed sighting. However, However, there was an event in 1950 that forced the general public to come to terms with the idea that there could be ape men running around Ape Canyon, or at least a large predator somewhere out there. In 1950, 32-year-old Jim Carter was a member of the National Ski Patrol at a ski area called the Milwaukee Bowl, which is in the state of Washington. Like everybody else on the ski patrol, Jim was a highly skilled skier and mountaineer. In May of that year, Jim was a part of a 20-person climbing party from Seattle, Washington. Their plan was to go to Mount St. Helens, hike up above the tree line, pick a spot, and then ski back down again. So the group arrives at Mount St. Helens, they hike up the the mountain, they reach the spot where they want to ski down from, they sit down, they're putting their skis on, and Jim puts his on, and he says to the group, hey, why don't I ski down a little ways, I'll set up my camera on a tripod, and I'll take a picture of you guys as you pass, and then I'll follow you down to the bottom. And the group said, great, that sounds awesome. And Jim wanted to use his camera, so it was a win-win. So Jim, in full view of the entire group as they're getting ready, he skis down a little ways and then turns left into an area called Dog's Head, which was a little bit flatter than the area they were in, so probably a better spot to set up his tripod. But as soon as he turned left into that area, he was out of view of the main group. So after a few minutes, as the group is getting their stuff on, they took a little bit longer because they're trying to time it. So they all leave at the same time because they want to get this picture all at once. And so they take a little bit of extra time. They're all ready. And then finally, they head down and they make that left. They're going to pass by Dog's Head specifically so Jim can take their picture. But when they bank around the corner... Jim's not there. And so they're looking around and they're saying to each other, did he tell us he was going somewhere else? Because it seemed an awful lot like he was going to Dog's Head, but obviously he's not here. And so someone said, well, maybe he got annoyed with us because we were taking so long to get ready up there and he just already went to the bottom. And so they agreed, that's what he did. And so they got back together again and they headed down to the bottom. But when they got to the bottom, Jim wasn't there. And so they sat there for a few extra minutes looking up at the mountain and they're they're kind of scanning down at the bottom and they're looking all over the place, but there's no sign of Jim. And so the group started to get really worried and they contacted authorities. When the first search team arrived, they went up to the area where the group thought Jim had been setting up at Dog's Head. And as they were looking around, all they could find was this discarded film box. So not any film or camera inside, just a box that would have held the film. It was kind of buried in the snow. Near this film box, they found Jim Carter's ski tracks and they were not angled south towards the bottom of the mountain where the whole ski group had gone. They were angled east towards Ape Canyon. And they followed Jim's tracks and they said they never deviated. They were total straight lines like he was not trying to slow down. In fact, he was trying to go as fast as he possibly could. And at some point he began leaping over these huge ice crevasses that if you miss time, it's a death sentence. You're going into the crevasse. And he didn't just jump over one. He jumped over two, three, four at full speed with out slowing down and then his tracks got all the way to the edge where it overlooked Ape Canyon and he went flying off. When the head of the search team saw this crazy ski line from Jim Carter, he said to the media that the only reason a guy like Jim, an expert skier who would never take risks like this, the only reason he would be skiing like this is if his life was in danger or if he was being pursued. So the search teams moved down into Ape Canyon and for five days, 75 people combed the entirety of Ape Canyon up and back over and over and over again. They never found Jim and they never found his skis or his camera or anything. And the whole time they were looking, those 75 searchers would report that anytime they were alone, they had the distinct feeling they were being watched. And it got so uncomfortable for many of them that they refused to go back into the gorge unless they had someone right next to them. After those five days of searching almost exclusively inside of Ape Canyon, they spent another five days not only continuing to search Ape Canyon, but also the surrounding areas. And finally, after 10 days of finding no trace of Jim Carter, the search was terminated. The only rational thing 
thing investigators could point to as the reason behind why this happened to Jim was he was diabetic and he had forgotten his insulin that day. So perhaps he became hypoglycemic and he became confused and then managed to ski off the cliff into Ape Canyon where he landed in such a way that he remained hidden. Or like the head of the search party seems to think, he was being pursued. He was skiing for his life. Whatever was chasing him had scared him so badly that he was skiing in a straight line down a cliff, jumping over ice crevasses before falling into Ape Canyon. And then presumably whatever forced him off the edge went down and scooped him up and took him away. And that's why they couldn't find him. But unless someone finds his body or finds some other piece of compelling evidence, we will probably never know for sure what happened to Jim Carter. Somewhere out in the Sierra Nevada mountain range lies a small hunting camp that's been there since the 1950s. Despite its fame, only a handful of people know exactly where this camp is. But even if you were given explicit directions on how to get there, you might just walk past it because it's tucked away in the middle of the woods up on this mountain. It's just a small fire pit, a couple of logs around it, another log set up for cutting wood, and you know, there's some paths that have been beaten down over the years from its occupants, but it's pretty much unremarkable. According to camp members, the fastest way to get to the site is by horseback, and it's approximately eight miles, and it's through very rugged terrain on this mountain, and it includes a 4,000 foot elevation gain. However, this eight mile trail is not marked and every year it changes slightly because trees will fall along the way changing the topography. Ron Moorhead, who's one of the four original camp members, laments the fact that anybody knows anything about this campsite. He wishes they could have kept it a secret but he knew that wasn't an option after what they discovered there in late 1971. In early 1971, Ron was a young man and he was invited out for the first time to the Sierra camp by the three founding members. When Ron got there, he fell in love. It was this beautiful, natural, pristine wilderness that overlooked this amazing valley and they're surrounded by these huge white fir trees. There's a freshwater stream that trickled by. And in terms of hunting, the deer were plentiful. Ron said this campsite was the closest to heaven he thinks he'll ever get. The only real drawback of the site was the large bear population, but they always had guns on them and they built this shelter out of heavy fallen timbers that they could go inside, shut the door, and they'd be protected from the bears until they left. When there wasn't a bear threat, they slept on the ground in tents. In late 1971, Ron came back to the camp with the other three founding members. They'd had a great day of hunting and they were standing around the campfire just chatting with each other when they started hearing a grunting sound not far away from them in the forest. Now, typically, whenever a bear came to their campsite, it was usually at night and they would hear it grunting somewhere off in the forest. And as soon as they heard it, they would stop and they would listen to kind of confirm it was a bear. And if it was, they would go inside of their shelter and they would wait for it to leave. But this time, when they stopped to listen to confirm it was a bear, the sound they heard next was something they had never heard before, and it was so frightening, they almost fell over each other running to get inside of the shelter. It was like a whooping sound you would expect from an ape, except instead of a series of whoops like you would expect from an ape, it was one loud whoop, and then silence, and then another creature somewhere else made a responding whoop that sounded different than the first. There was at least two creatures that were basically speaking to each other out in the forest out of view. Ron would say, as these creatures were howling and whooping at each other out in the forest, the men were huddled around inside of the shelter looking at each other like, what is that? Has anybody heard that sound before? And nobody knew what it was. And after a little while, they heard these creatures running towards the camp. They were pretty well off, but they heard these heavy footsteps approaching. And so Ron and the others, they put themselves up against these slats inside of the shelter where they could look out in the direction where these creatures were. And they're staring out just past the light of their campfire into the dark forest. And they hear these things running, 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 and they stop. They don't come into the clearing. It's like they're just outside of where they could see. And then their tone completely changes. These creatures, which are now one on one side of the camp and one on the other, begin speaking to each other in a language that almost sounds human, but it was nonsensical. It sounded like an imitation of a human language, but not human. And so Ron and the others are terrified and they're just staring through the slats, waiting to see this creature that's gonna emerge at some point, but it never does. Instead, the creatures continue to stay outside of the light and they move around behind their shelter out of view. And so Ron and the others move to the very middle of their shelter to get as far away from the walls as they can because there are breaks in the walls and they're worried one of these things is gonna reach through and grab them. But finally, after hours of these creatures running around the perimeter of their camp communicating in this totally otherworldly language, they 
started whooping again and ran off. And for the rest of the night, Ron and the other three stayed right in that shelter. The next day when the sun came up, the men were out of that camp as fast as they could. These are hard, rugged men, and they were very shaken up by this experience. And they tried to talk about it, but there was just no way to describe what they were hearing and experiencing. And so they just decided they just wanted to get out of there as fast as possible, and they'll deal with this later. But as soon as they got out of the woods and back to their homes, they didn't talk about it anymore, except Ron became obsessed with whatever it was that was making that sound. He so desperately wanted to find out what it was. And so he convinced the other three members to come with him and go back to the campsite, except this time Ron was gonna bring an audio recorder and he was gonna try to capture some audio of these creatures. And so the four men went back to the campsite. They didn't even hunt that day. They stayed right near the campsite. They made this big fire and they're all just kind of nervously sitting there waiting, kind of hoping it happens and also hoping it doesn't happen. And at some point in the evening, Ron said he heard footsteps way out in the middle of the forest and they sounded like they were running towards the camp. The four men sprint inside the shelter, lock it behind them, and Ron turns on the audio recorder. Now, before you listen to this famous recording, here are its bona fides. After being recorded, Ron sent it to Dr. R. Lynn Curlin, who is a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Wyoming, and he and his team analyzed it, and they concluded that one, it was unaltered, so it's not been edited, it's not been doctored in any way, it's an authentic audio recording. And two, whatever was making the sounds could not have been a man because their vocal range was dramatically higher and lower than that of a human's. The doctor said based on average average pitch and tract length, the creature that was making the sound most likely was between seven foot three and eight feet tall. In addition to the Dr. Curlin examination, a cryptolinguist expert named Scott Nelson also pointed out that it would have been nearly impossible in 1971 for Ron or any of the other hunters to dub the sound of their voices, which are on the recording, over the sounds that these creatures were making. Because a couple times in the recording, you hear both sets of voices happening at once. That's something you couldn't have done in 1971. Despite numerous attempts to debunk this recording, it still stands as a legitimate, unedited recording. Although what they were recording is still a mystery. Have a listen. Shortly after this recording was made, Ron stopped hunting at this camp. However, over the years, he has gone back several times because he's obsessed with trying to find out what's out in the forest. But he says to this day, he still has no idea. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's video, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please go over to the like button's house on the next really hot day and ask them to get you a cold drink. While they're gone, put a large raw salmon in their AC vent. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya. Every year, hundreds of people go missing under baffling conditions in the woods of North America. I'm talking about people being right in front of their friends or their loved ones, and then in an instant, they're just gone, and they're never found again. 
or they are found again, but they're found in places that are seemingly impossible to get to. One former police detective named David Politis has written a book series called Missing 411, where he investigates these incredibly strange cases. Today, we're gonna to look at three Missing 411 cases that even amongst strange disappearances, these rank as particularly bizarre. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please replace the Like Button's 2021 calendar with a 2020 calendar that has a one glued over the zero. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On June 16, 1946, five members of the Van Ulst family arrived at the Devil's Den State Park in western Arkansas to spend a week in a cabin they had rented. After getting unpacked, the father, along with his daughter, who was eight years old, named Catherine, and her two older brothers, they headed down to the swimming area, which was this creek that led up to the side of a dam. Once they arrived at the creek, Catherine and her two brothers jumped in the water and started goofing around, and there were some other kids there they were playing with as well, and their father just sat on the edge to watch. Now, the swimming area had one really Really deep section that was right up against the dam wall that you were allowed to swim in but the kids that were not strong swimmers tended to stay away from and Catherine was not a great swimmer and at one point she kind of drifted into the deep section and her father didn't notice and her two brothers didn't notice but a woman who was staying at the campground who the Van Alst family didn't know happened to be standing next to the edge of the water and saw Catherine struggling and so she reached in and pulled her out and Catherine was fine and the woman told her you got to be more careful you shouldn't be swimming in the deep end if you're not a strong swimmer and Catherine said, okay. And so as they're talking, Catherine's father hears them and looks over and sees his daughter talking to some stranger. And so he makes a sound and waves in their direction to get this woman's attention to be like, hey, you know, what are you doing talking to my daughter? And the woman, she sees this and she must've been a mother herself because she picked up on his uncomfortability. And so she turns to him and says, oh, no, everything is totally fine. I was just helping your daughter get out. Everything is totally fine. And so Catherine's father turns to his daughter and says, hey, you gotta be more careful. Don't go in the deep end. And Catherine's like, okay. And instead of going back into the water, Catherine walks to the backside of the dam because this dam, it was not a steep drop off on the outflow side. It was like a gradual slope of these big boulders that the kids at this campground would climb all over and their parents would watch them from their positions next to the swimming area. And so Catherine's father was watching his two sons and then he'd look over and watch Catherine and back and forth, he kept his eye on all of his kids. But at some point when he was looking at his sons, he looked back at Catherine and she was gone. And so he stood up and he walked over thinking maybe she's gone all the way to the bottom and she's just out of sight because she's crouched down or something. But when he got to the edge and looked down, she wasn't down there. And so he's looking all around and he's thinking to himself, this is impossible. I just saw her on the rocks like seconds ago. Where could she have gone? And so he looks at his sons who are still in the swimming area and he says, hey, have you seen Catherine? And they're like, no, we haven't seen her. And then he turns to the woman that had previously pulled Catherine out of the water and he says have you seen my daughter and she said no the last I saw her she was on the rocks I don't know where she went and so before long Catherine's father is screaming for Catherine he's enlisted the help of everybody at this campground that's in the vicinity to go look for his daughter there are people jumping into the swimming area up top there are people jumping into the swimming area on the back side of the dam I mean the whole area is getting searched and there's no sign of this girl and after about an hour of looking Catherine's father went and got police after two days of searching the very thick forest that surrounds this dam and finding no trace of Catherine, authorities decided it was far more likely she had drowned either above or below the dam than it was that she wandered off into the woods considering where she was last seen. And so they shifted focus and began draining these two sections of water to see if her body would be at the bottom. But when they were drained, she wasn't there. And so once again, they went back to searching the forest. And so on June 22nd, six days after Catherine went missing, a group of searchers were located seven miles way into the forest. They were walking up this mountain and they're yelling Catherine's name. And as they're walking, they stop when this little girl wearing only a bathing suit walks out of a cave, looks down at them and just says, here I am. The searchers couldn't believe it. It was Catherine. And besides some scratches on her arms and some bug bites, she seemed like she was perfectly fine. In fact, they would say she was eerily calm. It was like she was waking up from a dream. She was reunited with her family who could not believe she was still alive. They brought her to the hospital and the doctors looked at her and said, yep, besides some superficial cuts and some bug bites, she's fine. And two days later, she was discharged. 
So this eight-year-old, who's never spent any time in the woods before, this is her first exposure, her trip to Devil's Den State Park, survives on her own out in the wild for six days and six nights with only a bathing suit on. And despite there being no potable water anywhere near her where she was found up on that mountain, she was determined to be relatively well hydrated and had only lost a couple of pounds. Also, you need to understand the staggering distance she covered because while she was found seven miles away from where she went missing, that's as the crow flies. That's what you see on a map, those seven miles. In the wild, you don't walk perfectly straight lines. There's too many obstructions there's mountains, there's trees, there's all sorts of reasons that you end up zigging and zagging to wherever you're going. And so rescuers believe the minimum real distance she would have covered to get up to that cave was about 30 miles and she did it barefoot. Catherine defied every search and rescue model for eight-year-olds that get lost in the wild. She was way outside the boundaries of what anybody would expect. Basically, she should have died. When authorities asked her, you know, how did you do this? She said, I don't know. I don't remember how I got lost in the first place. I only remember sleeping on warm grass the first night and then her next memory is waking up inside of a cave on day six. She has no idea what happened between day one and day six when she traveled those 30 miles and somehow subsisted on some water source and some food source. While some say this is just a really weird case where she got very, very lucky, Others think there was something in the forest that chased her and adrenaline kicked in, forcing her to run the 30 miles to that cave. And because it was so traumatic, she forgot the experience. But like virtually all of the missing 411 stories, we have a lot more questions than answers. On April 29th, 2001, six-year-old Haley Zega was on a hike with her grandparents in a very rural part of Arkansas called the Upper Buffalo Wilderness Area. For an area to be deemed a wilderness area, that means no vehicles of any kind can come through there, making it incredibly remote and incredibly wild, hence the name. They had taken this trail that brought them up to the top of this bluff that was about 200 feet higher than where they started. And they got to this incredible overlook and they're, they're looking down over this river. And at some point at about 11 in the morning, they turn around to head back. On the return trip by about 11.30, they're making their way down and Haley spots a waterfall that's off the side of the path. And she wants to go to it. She asks her grandparents, can we go check out this waterfall? And the grandparents kind of scope it out. And it seemed like the only way they could get down to view this waterfall would be by literally climbing a tree and descending over this cliff. And it was something that the grandparents just did not feel comfortable letting their granddaughter do. And so they told Haley, no, we need to keep going. We're not gonna go check out that waterfall. And Haley, being a six-year-old, she really wanted to see this waterfall and she wanted to get her way. And so she threw a tantrum and she sat down on the trail and she said, well, if you're not gonna take me to the waterfall, I'm not gonna move, you're gonna have to carry me. And the grandparents were like, no, we're not gonna carry you. You need to be a big girl. I need you to stand up and start walking with us. And Haley refused. And so her grandparents said, okay, we're gonna leave you. And they turned around and they kept walking down the trail, not far, and they were still totally in view and it's broad daylight. And they would turn around expecting their granddaughter to stand up and kind of begrudgingly walk after them. And at some point she did. Haley stood up and she's like, okay, you know, wait for me. And so she starts walking and the grandparents are like, all right. And so they're walking ahead of Haley. And as they're walking, Haley would just slow down more and more and more. And her grandparents could tell she was doing this. She was just trying to be frustrating and she was intentionally trying to take as long as she could. But the grandparents made sure they kept her in their views. They would walk a little ways and turn and she'd be right there. They'd walk a little ways, they'd turn and she'd be right there over and over again. And then at some point when they turned, she wasn't there. And so the grandparents immediately run back up and they're looking around for Haley, thinking she probably darted behind a tree to hide because she wants you know, to be a little bit more frustrating for them. And so they're kind of looking for her. They're not that worried yet. They start yelling for her saying, come on, we do gotta leave. You gotta come out, we gotta go. But there was no word from Haley. It was just silence and she was just totally gone. And for the next 90 minutes, the grandparents just ran all up and down this trail screaming for Haley and they never found her. And so they ran down and they called police. The largest search and rescue mission in the history of Arkansas was launched for Haley Zega. It included hundreds of searchers on the ground, including eight dog teams and helicopters overhead. There were firefighters, the National Guard was involved. But after two days, despite this incredible search, really no progress had been made. The only thing that had been found was one of the dog teams had tracked her scent up to a nearby road where the dog stopped, meaning the scent is now gone. And unfortunately, what that told 
investigators is it looks like Haley got picked up by some motorist. But 51 hours into the ordeal, there were two searchers well outside of the primary search area. They were about two miles away from where she'd gone missing. They spotted her. She was sitting next to this brook with her feet dangling in the water. And when she saw them, she kind of waved and they said, are you Haley Zaga? And she said, yeah. And she had a couple of scratches on her arm and on her face, but overall she seemed okay. And so Haley was reunited with her family and then she was brought to the hospital to be observed. After Haley had regained some of her strength, investigators asked her, you know, what happened? And she said that she was walking behind her grandparents and that she looked down. And then when she looked up again, not only were her grandparents gone, but she was looking at this wall of trees. Like she was not on the trail anymore. She didn't know where she was. And since she was only six years old, she didn't stop and look around or yell. Instead, she just kept walking in this direction that she didn't recognize. And she walked and walked and walked and she never found the trail again. She said pretty soon it got dark and she slept on top of that bluff. And then the next day when the sun came up, she walked down the bluff and she made it to the river. And then she walked along the river until she found a cave where she slept for the second night. And then the next day when she got up, she was found. After she gave this explanation, investigators had a lot of questions. Like if you were sleeping up on the bluff on that first night, then why couldn't the helicopter see you? Because that's all they were doing was flying over the bluff and they had thermal imaging. They could have very easily picked you up. And so they asked her, you know, are you sure that's where you were? And she said, yeah, that's where Alicia told me to stay. And they were like, who's Alicia? And she said, oh, she's my imaginary friend. I met her on the bluff. And so immediately the investigators and the parents are like, okay, she's clearly coping with this traumatic event by creating this imaginary friend. And so they don't ask any more questions about the imaginary friend. Instead, they continue to ask questions about basically how she got from where she was lost to where she was found. And they say, okay, Haley, how did you get down the bluffs? Because there's only one way down and it can be hard to find, especially if you're off the trail. And Haley said, well, Alicia brought me to a trail and she led me down the bluffs. And she stood in front of me and made sure that I didn't fall forward. And so her parents and the investigators are now starting to think, you know, maybe this isn't an imaginary friend if this person is right in front of her kind of propping her up. And so they ask Haley, you know, can you describe what Alicia looks like? And Haley said, sure, she has black hair, brown eyes, she's a little bit shorter than me, she's four years old, she likes to tell jokes, and she likes to sing songs. And then Haley began singing songs that she had learned from Alicia and began telling jokes she had learned from Alicia. Even though Haley was giving this vivid description of this four year old girl named Alicia running around the bluffs, it just couldn't be possible. And so Haley's parents and the investigators went back to treating Alicia as just an imaginary friend, just a simple coping mechanism. And so the investigators went back to just doing their interview with Haley. They got all the information about how she got from the bluffs down to the river as much as they could. And then because Haley was fine, they said, okay, you're good. See you later. Now Haley's case was a really big deal and it was all over the news, especially after she was found. And so her interview where she said this imaginary friend named Alicia had assisted her in getting down the bluffs and had basically taken care of her, that was put in print. And after it was published, there were some readers that realized there was another little girl who had gone missing in the exact same spot as Haley 23 years earlier. She was four years old. She had black hair, brown eyes. Her name was Alana and she had died on those bluffs. After this connection was made, it got national media attention because suddenly news outlets were saying this imaginary friend was actually Alana and that she was Haley's guardian angel. In fact, Haley was brought on Dateline to talk about her imaginary friend. This year, Haley, who's now 25 years old, posted a video to her YouTube channel where she tells her story of what happened over those 51 hours she was gone. And in the story, she talks about her imaginary friend. And she says, you know, before Alicia, I never had an imaginary friend. And Afterwards, I never had an imaginary friend. But at the time, Alicia was very real to me, and I don't know who or what she was, but she saved my life. In September of 2012, 53-year-old Linda Ortega went to visit her brother, Eddie Huff, in St. Joe, Arkansas. St. Joe is a very rural part of Arkansas, and it's about a mile away from the Buffalo River National Park. The park is thickly forested and mountainous, and there's hundreds of small water bodies that are strewn throughout. On Saturday, September 22nd, Linda and Eddie decided to go for a walk in the park because Eddie apparently had heard of some great fishing spot, and he wanted to go find it. In searching for the spot, they stepped off of the trail and got turned around. 
Now they realized they got turned around, but it's broad daylight and they figured, okay, we'll find the trail soon. But as the sun was setting, they had still not found the trail and they realized they were badly lost. Then some very strange things happened that we only have a marginal understanding of. What we know is the brother and sister were together on that first day they went missing. We know they were together the following day on Sunday, still looking around for a way out of the park, but still at the end of the day were lost. Then the next day on Monday, we know the pair separated because Eddie re-emerged out of the park, hopped in his car like nothing was going on, drove back to his house, walked inside, and his family's like, where have you been? You've been missing, we've been calling you, where have you been, and where's Linda? And he's like, oh, everything's fine. I dropped Linda off at a relative's house. She's fine too. And his family's looking at him like, do you not understand that you've been missing for like three days here? And he was just trying to tell them that everything was fine. But as they asked him more questions about specifically, what were you doing? Specifically, how did you get lost? Specifically, what time did you drop Linda off? Tell us all the details. As they did that, Eddie started to realize that, oh my goodness, I actually don't know what happened. And so his family called this relative that Eddie had claimed he dropped Linda off at. And when the relative picked up, they said, no, we don't have Linda here. I've not spoken to Eddie and I've not spoken to Linda. And so the family turns back to Eddie and they're like, where's Linda? And Eddie just said, I have no idea. And so the family contacts police and a search is launched for Linda. And they look all over this park for days and days and there's no sign of Linda. And people are starting to get really worried about her. And then on Thursday, so three days after Eddie had re-emerged from the park and five days after they had originally gone missing, some searchers that were on ATVs were about two miles away from the entrance of the park in this very thick area and they found Linda and she was alive. And initially, just like her brother Eddie, she really had no idea what was going on. She said she didn't understand how she got where she was and she was just really confused. And so they brought her back to the hospital and they put her under doctor's care and she ended up being fine. But as she's laying in the hospital, she starts kind of coming to and her memories start flooding back. And she tells the story of what happened to her and it's unbelievable. She said she and Eddie went into the park to find that fishing spot. And at some point they stepped off the trail thinking they were gonna to find it, but they didn't. They got turned around, they were lost, and they were confident they were going to find the trail and get out the same day, but they didn't. And so the sun went down and they were forced to sleep out in the wild. And so the next morning they get up and they continue to look around. They're yelling for help and there's no one around. They're in this very dense part of the forest. And all day, again, they're looking for this trail and they don't find it. And so that night, again, they sleep out in the wild. Linda said her memory, starting with the next day, which was Monday, started to get really foggy. She said she woke up and for some reason she just got up and started running into the woods. She thinks it's because she thought Eddie was hurt and she was running to get help. And so it must have been around this time that Eddie, in his dazed state, got up and meandered his way successfully out of the park. Meanwhile, Linda said she was just running like a maniac into the middle of the woods, screaming for help from someone, even though she's in the middle of nowhere. And then miraculously, she says she saw a group of people way off in the distance. It looked like a group of hikers. And she started yelling for them and waving to them and trying to get their attention. And she said they all stopped and turned to look at her, but they didn't show any sign that they had actually heard her. They were not trying to interact with her. They were just looking looking at her. Linda said she thought that was pretty odd, but she just kept on running towards them and screaming and yelling and trying to get their attention. And she said when she got about a hundred meters away from them, instead of them reciprocating waves or making a sound, they all ducked behind trees like they were trying to hide from Linda. Linda said this was the first time she felt really unsettled by what was happening, but she was desperate. She needed help. And so she just kept walking towards them. And she got to about 50 meters away when they all poked their heads out and looked out at her and then poked their heads back. Like they were not trying to interact with her. And Linda said she felt really scared and stopped and began backpedaling away from this weird group of people that are hiding behind trees. And so while keeping her eyes on the general area where she knew they were hiding, she backpedaled all the way back to about 100 to maybe 150 meters away again. And this group came out from behind the trees and continued to stare at Linda. Linda said at this point, she was terrified. She didn't know who or what those things were, but they were not there to help her. And then she said her memory got really foggy because all of a sudden her next memory is her laying on the ground in this pitch black forest. Her brother's not near her and she's hearing footsteps and she believes it's this group of people or things that are walking towards her, but it's so dark she can't see anything. 
And she said all night she heard the sounds of these people or things walking around the perimeter of where she was laying totally exposed in the middle of the forest. Linda said her memories from this point until she was rescued are all mixed together. But she said she had one memory that really stood out to her because it was so terrifying. She said on one of the last mornings she was out there, she woke up, she was laying on the ground, she opens her eyes and it was still dark, but the sun was starting to come up. And so there was enough light that she could begin to make out the way out of the forest. And so she sat up and immediately got the sense that she was being watched, but she didn't know by who or from where it was coming. She just had this intuitive sense that she was being watched. And as she's feeling this way, she hears movement coming off to her right and she turns and standing next to a tree about maybe 20 meters away is this dark silhouette of a man who's just staring at her. He's got no features. He's just this shadowy figure. And so she's horrified. And then she realizes there's another one. And she looks at that one and realizes there's another one and another one and another one. They're all around her. They're all around her looking in these dark shadowy figures. And she's so scared. And as she's looking around at all of them, it seems like they registered that she sees them. And at that point, they all turned and start running into the forest in all different directions. She said after that, she has no idea the sequence of events or what happened. All she knows is that the whole time she was out there, she was scared. She felt like there were people watching her in the woods. And then at some point, rescuers showed up and she was saved. Linda's totally crazy account of what happened, combined with Eddie's bizarre behavior, totally baffled investigators. They really didn't know what to make of this. How did Eddie find his way out again? And why did he think Linda was at a relative's house? And who were the people Linda was seeing? And why can't either of them remember 90% of the experience? One theory is they must have eaten berries or some other food item that had hallucinogenic properties and they were literally just hallucinating the whole time. However, if you follow along with David Politis's missing 411 phenomenon, or if you watch some of the videos on this channel about the missing 411, then you know there are lots of other examples of people that go missing in the woods of North America that never ingest any food or any liquid, so there's no hallucinogen in their system, and they still have similar experiences to what Linda and Eddie did. So how do you explain that? So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button's 2021 calendar with a 2020 calendar that has a one glued over the zero. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's gonna do it. See ya.